All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started for those that are outside and hopefully got enough caffeine to keep them going through our very busy day here at the World Health Summit. Let's go ahead and get started with today's session um, entitled A New Lens on Investment in Health and Well-Being. My name is David Humphreys. I'm from The Economist Impact, and I have the pleasure of moderating this wonderful keynote session. I think today's session and topic is something that's been long discussed before the pandemic and during COVID-19, but is very timely given the path we're on, that new lens. And Dr. Ted just reminded us yesterday to be able to take that take leap forward, that path forward. We need that new paradigm shift, and that includes an investment, and an investment includes financing and people and infrastructure and knowledge and the like. And so it is a very timely topic for us to talk about here today. We'll transition to our panel very shortly, um, but I want to set the stage here with a couple of important trends, and they're very simple. The first is opportunity. And you can see through this whole summit, the areas of innovation, the promise of the younger generation, the things that we should be excited about, the challenge to be able to, to solve the problems that are here to come. From my perspective, it is this groundswell in seeing a new definition and enhanced focus on the concept of well-being coming from individuals and from communities and from organizations, and essentially demanding a better and new approach to well-being. The flip side, there are challenges, challenges in economic headwinds, challenges in fiscal budgets. I also wanna make sure as we think about those challenges and talk about the challenges, we don't forget about the human element. And we were reminded about that last night and talk about the voice of the children and the challenges they face today, moving forward in health and the broader society. The third piece is that way forward, and that way forward in many cases will be determined by people in this room. Um, that way forward isn't necessarily defined as an opportunity for us to be able to improve versus the cost of inaction, the cost of the status quo, the cost of going back to past norms. And I think with that and the purpose of the panel here is we will not be able to get there in our siloed nature, the cross sectorial approach to health for all is gonna be very critical. So with that said, today we're going to cover a variety of areas, the public sector investment, sustainable and empowerment for future investments, the role of the private sector in a ways that are the same that we've been talking about for some time, but also coming from an investor perspective and really driving that good behavior and what is good for society. And the last piece, that cross-sectorial piece, all actors prioritizing health as they would do any other KPI in their organizations in their countries. Before we get and I invite our panelists up, I'm delighted to be able to, to share with you a, a video that former UK Prime Minister and current WHO Ambassador for Health Finance and Gordon Brown has prepared to help set the stage for today's conversation. Please cue the video. Good afternoon. It's a privilege to be, you might say, warm-up speaker for a brilliant panel of health leaders, indeed health pioneers, whom I know are awash with ideas about the power and potential of innovative financing to meet and master the challenges of funding global health. President Kennedy once warned us that those who build the present in the image of the past will miss out entirely on the opportunities of the future. And all of us here today, from the WHO, Gavi, and the Global Fund to other brilliant agents of change, have our eyes fixed on the prize, new and additional resources to sustainably fight disease, promote well-being, and prepare for all future threats and possibilities. We start, however, from brutal truth, that while COVID brought a 35% increase in aid for health to top up high levels of domestic resource mobilization, if mainly in the richest countries, the current and future financing gaps between what the world invests in health and what we need to invest have never been greater. With domestic mobilization of resources in low and middle income countries so stretched that most will not reach their health targets by 2030. And so first, I want to appeal today to rich countries to raise their development aid budgets, not least to meet the gaps in funding that the WHO, Act A, and the Global Fund currently face. But let us face facts too about the $150 a year global aid budget that while aid necessarily accounts for 29% of health spending in low-income countries, 12% in lower middle-income countries, it is in itself completely inadequate to meet the international community's agreed obligations to the health sustainable development goals. 
Already, even before COVID, the annual SDG funding gap was estimated at $371 billion. And so it is time for a step change in delivering on the new principle set down at Addis Ababa in 2015, repeated by the G20 high-level panel on pandemic preparedness, echoed only last week by the US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, but yet to be delivered, that aid has to become the platform for mobilizing not just billions, but trillions for global health, not least by making private capital and capital markets work for developing countries. Let's look at all possible new sources of development finance. Additional grant raising through not just higher aid budgets, but new forms of global taxes should be on the agenda. In the UK, but even more so in France, airline taxes have been hypothecated to global health. And there is scope for domestic sin taxes, e.g. on sugar, to be hypothecated too. But the real potential lies in the wide space between donor grants and purely commercial capital. The space in between, itemized by the French government, which set down 42 mechanisms for innovative uh, instruments and modalities, which have been categorized as, and I want to look at each briefly, socially responsible investment, where private capital can at one and the same time secure a market return and support development, conditional funding, grant financing from donors based on performance conditions, guaranteeing outcomes, impact investing, where donors choose a social impact and not just financial returns, so we do good and do well at the same time, and catalytic funding. And here I will want to emphasize the untapped potential beyond grants and loans for donor country guarantees as a platform for leveraging up additional resources. But first, health needs that breakthrough in ESG, for in the 867 pages of the Global Reporting Initiative used by 73% of the 250 largest global companies, only occupational and customer health and safety are highlighted. So as ESG becomes mainstream, I hope one of the messages from today is that clear performance indicators for health have to be a core element of ESG expanded into ESGH. And here we can build, as the panel will hear from its CEO, on the Access to Nutrition Initiative, which already benchmarks nutrition, trans fats, and breast milk substitutes. Conditional funding with performance targets, strings attached, if you like, to grant financing, debt swaps, and outcome-linked buy-downs are also needing to be boosted. I congratulate the Global Fund for Childhood Cancer Medicines, a platform linking St. Jude's Hospital in the States and the WHO, and I'd like to see it evolve into a Global Fund for Cancer, philanthropic and private capital, married together in providing drugs, treatments, and medicines, in bulk through consolidating global demand while delivering affordable prices. When it comes to impact investment, Ronnie Cohn, whom I've worked with for many years, will describe how public sector funds and concessional finance can catalyze private investment so that private enterprise is no longer just about risk and reward, but risk, reward, and socially progressive results. And we can move to what he and I want to see over time, social impact weighted accounts side by side with traditional profit and loss accounts. Now, catalytic funding has seen big advances with public agencies partnering with private capital markets to build from donor pledges, as with support for the issuance of low-risk bonds with a market-based return, like IFIM, whose start I was involved with, front-loading Gavi vaccinations with 6.8 billion now of privately raised resources, most recently $750 million for COVAX money paid back by donor governments over 30 years. The IFIN model that I believe could be extended would include not just front-loading vaccines for, say, neglected tropical diseases, but front-loading the building of capacity in healthcare systems in poorer countries. Of all the initiatives in this area that include pooled investment funds, public-private co-funding, seed funding, first-loss capital, and so on, let me highlight the potential also to extend advanced market commitments. Introduced a decade and a half ago to advance vaccines against pneumonia, now recently used to advance COVID vaccines, there are many opportunities for donor governments to underwrite risk, create a market, and meet aggregate demand. And I see even more potential in the use of guarantees, principally by donor governments. Sweden's CEDA has been at the forefront of using their country's balance sheet to leverage development finance. Now this year, working with the ADB, AFDB, UK, Netherlands, 500 million of guarantees will support the International Finance Facility for Education 
raising over $2 billion in resources as a result, a model that, as two recent reports to the G20 have said, has resonance for global health. By combining sovereign donor guarantees together with some paid-in capital, we can lever leverage up $1 billion in guarantees and around $200 million or so of grants to create nearly $5 billion of resources for health, a leverage that is around 25 times the grant in contrast to the five times leverage IRBD, the lending arm of the World Bank, can offer. We will hear from the African Union President and EIB Global, a branch of EIB, partnering with the WHO and the European Commission, which will now contribute half a billion euros to mobilize a billion of public health investment across Africa. And I also applaud the announcement in July that the EIB and Gates will partner to prevent polio and infectious diseases as well as on R&D and building health system capacity. And I welcome to the financing model proposed for Act A, 100% grants for the poorest countries, 60% grants for low and middle income countries. And I do foresee a future where our pandemic financing facility blends multilateral development bank finance and guarantees with donor country grants from the Financial Intermediacy Fund jointly set up by the World Bank and WHO, which now needs to secure the remaining 8.6 billion of its 10 billion funding. Now I end with what I think are two central observations and in fact recommendations. The multilateral development banks should be charged not just with helping low and middle income countries reduce ill health and poverty, but with financing global public goods. Here in health, working as a financial arm for the WHO and global health agencies. And as Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary of the US said last week, an urgent review is needed to ensure the World Bank mobilizes the resources to do more, not just it to include global health directly, but as a partner in innovative finance. Now, two facts stand out. While their spending increased during the worst of COVID, World Bank financing for health fell back by 1.8 billion in 2021 to less than 10% of its commitments. And if we take overall IBRD allocations over 50 years, they're around 0.5% of GDP now in the countries they serve, in contrast to twice as much, over 1% in 1960. So we need our international institutions to provide a stronger platform for innovative finance to do more. And secondly, whether it be multilateral, bilateral aid, which are, as I said, the platform upon which we can mobilize private finance. We need a commitment from the world's richest countries to fairly share the burdens. UN peacekeeping is financed by sharing the cost between countries, as is a rising proportion of WHO funds. But Act A and COVAC and so many other initiatives have to rely on passing around the begging bowl. When in 1966, the world sought to eliminate smallpox a burden sharing agreement between countries was possible. Surely we can do much more in 2022 so that new agreements on burden sharing as well as enhanced multilateral bank financing can be the basis for generating predictable and sustained resources upon which innovative financing can deliver for millions and the war we are fighting against not just poverty but ill health and disease can be won. Thank you. All right. Thank you to Mr. Brown for his time and his words that had set the stage for a really interesting conversation. And with that said, I want to be able to invite our panelists up to the stage. We could start with Dr. Ikawuma Adesina from the President of the African Development Bank Group. Next. We had the Honorable Esther Pasiris, Member of Parliament for Nairobi City and the Kenyan National Assembly. Let's see if I can see the names in order here. We have Minister Ong Yi Kung, Minister for Health in Singapore. We have Dr. Jay Sriya Ayer, uh, the CEO of Access to Medicine Foundation. And Thomas Ostros who is the Vice President of European Investment Bank. Last but not least, I'm promised we have somebody on video, I believe from New York City, the Sir Ronald Cohen, who is amongst other things, the Chairman of Global Steering Group for Impact Investment. 
there, we can actually see the technology working and it's clear that he can hear us, which makes these things quite good. Let's go ahead and get started and talk about the, the public sector involvement that sustainable health financing, some of the legacies that come from COVID-19 and how we're able to make this a priority moving forward. And I wanna build on some of Mr. Brown's commentary um, particularly about the role of multilaterals. And maybe I'll start with you, Dr. Asina. Um, I was very keen to see the health strategy developed by your organization um, and how important that is an investment in key elements like infrastructure and R&D. Maybe you can address that approach, um, how this has become a, a new strategy for the African Development Bank um, and really touch upon some of the key elements and being able to really invest in the building blocks for future health across the continent. Well, thanks very much, Thomas. It's, it's nice to be, uh, to be here. It's actually my first time at the World Health Summit, so it's, it's great to be here. And I want to say I really appreciate what the Prime Minister, uh, Gordon Brown, was just saying about the importance of really scaling up financing uh, for health. Well, let me speak from the perspective of Africa and, and how bad things are. You know, I mean, you take a look at Africa, it's got 15% of the global population, but it accounts for 25% of all the disease burden of the world. And it accounts for 50% of all the people that die from non-communicable diseases are in Africa, which makes absolutely no sense. But the root cause of that has to be found in the way in which Africa has been investing, or under-investing, let me say, um, in, in health. Only 5% of the GDP is devoted to health compared to maybe Asia, Latin America, you find others with 20% of their GDP devoted to, uh, to, to that. But particularly worrying for me, which is what led to the strategy that you're talking about, is the underinvestment in infrastructure, health infrastructure. I mean, Africa needs about $26 billion a year for investing in infrastructure for health, but we're only investing $4.5 billion. So it's very, very small. So I, I grew up in a rural area. You go around, you find that at least most, of, let me say probably about 50% of the um, uh, rural clinics have no water and no sanitation. One third of them have no electricity, right? And then the number of beds is not enough. And when COVID struck, you were talking about the issue of COVID. We only had two services that could actually do clinical tests uh, in terms of testing for, for COVID. So basically the point is we have to change that. We have to significantly invest in health. And I remember asking Pedro, uh, the WHO uh, 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 Director General when during COVID, I said, well, look, Pedro, what can we do as African Development Bank? He said, well, look, infrastructure is what you told me you were gonna do, so do it. So we're gonna do it. So we decided to do that. So we set up this uh, infrastructure, quality health infrastructure for health and it is a $3 billion investment that we are going to be making in quality health infrastructure. It will address three things. First, primary healthcare. We know that 85% of all the challenges you have, if you can fix it from the primary healthcare, it'll be fine. So primary healthcare, but most of that is both clinical and non-clinical infrastructure, because as I said, most of them don't even have access to electricity or even water and sanitation. The second one is secondary and tertiary infrastructure that we want to do. And in Africa, a big problem is lack of good diagnostics. So we will focus a lot on diagnostic infrastructure for that. Now, let me also talk about another thing that it's not just the infrastructure, but also the medicines, right? Africa imports 70% of all of its medicines. And so I don't believe that Africa should outsource the, uh, the it, it, it's, it's health to the benevolence of others. We saw that during COVID, Africa didn't get access to vaccines. Everybody got booster shots. Africa was looking for basic shots. It couldn't get it. So we made a decision that we have to therefore have a healthcare defense system in Africa based, built on three pillars, the quality health infrastructure that I just mentioned, but also building Africa's pharmaceutical capacity, right, to be able to produce its own drugs. And of course, also its own vaccines. So that's what we've actually been doing that we're gonna invest about $3 billion in the pharmaceutical industry. We've also just set up something, uh, Tom, which is called the African Pharmaceutical Technology Foundation, which is to deal with the whole IP issue of how do you have access to proprietary technology to allow Africa to have both the knowledge, the know-how, uh, to be able to have access to antigens and also access to 
um, uh, 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 APIs to actually manufacture drugs by itself and build its own ecosystem of capacity for being able to do that. The last thing I want to say, because I think the session was talking about investing in health and also investing for health. I want to say something about investing for health, which builds on what the prime minister said. Three things on that is food. He mentioned the issue of nutrition. Africa suffers today for a tremendous amount of malnutrition, stunting. You know, 61 million kids that are stunted, you know, and that's a loss for us. 12 million people, kids that are wasted and over 10 million that are obese. And so the bank is investing in a multi-sectoral way, and you and I were talking about that before we came on stage, you know. We're investing in a multi-sectoral sector looking at um, uh, uh, looking at water and sanitation, looking at agriculture, looking at social protection, but also uh, making sure we invest as well in, in health. But the other part of that that I want to say is on energy. Without energy, you have absolutely nothing. Forget it. You know, and so we are investing uh, $25 billion in, in energy, most of it on renewable energy, so that we can connect a lot of these healthcare centers to electricity. That's a big, big issue. And the last thing I want to say is about climate change, because climate change affects every single thing. Uh, Tedro said something about it's not just, you know, health, but also things that happen outside of the health sector that actually affects uh, the things we deal with in the health sector. Climate change is one that we have to make sure that we can finance. The African Development Bank is trying to mobilize $25 billion for climate adaptation for Africa because that's Africa's major challenge. If you can able to deal with climate change, make sure we can build more resilience for farmers and all of that in rural areas. I think we'll be able to build more robust systems that can deal with many of the pandemic shocks that, that we have. So all of that, just to say this, the multilateral development banks have to do more and in trying to do more, we have to also spread our balance, stretch our balance sheet quite a bit more. And I'm happy to talk about that later, but thank you so far. Well, thank you for touching upon not just the future building box and building toward the future, but also starting to dovetail very nicely into that true interconnected cross-sectorial perspective. And maybe I can pivot to Mr. Ostros that you heard again, Mr. Brown, talk about some of the initiatives that your organization has been involved in. I know health and inequalities in particular has been important and offering not just your investment, also your expertise in being able to do so. Maybe you can talk about the experience that you've had, in particular those innovations that we're seeing that's new that can be a roadmap moving forward for multilaterals and the countries that you work with. Thank you, and thanks for the opportunity to be part of this uh, this panel. I must say what Gordon Brown said was um, very impressive. It's a broad-based program for what is needed. Uh, and I must uh, also admit that I, I, I agree with uh, uh, his message. And I think when it comes to health issues, what we have seen in recent years is health being married more to financial markets and banking than we've ever seen before. And I think that is a very important step because as Gordon Brown said, we need governments to put up more development aid. I agree with that, but we don't see that happen really. We need to also leverage uh, the development aid that is uh, uh, on the table and thereby using financial instruments, innovative engineer, financial engineering to see so that we get as most, the most possible impact uh, from that money. We are working very closely with the European Commission, of course, and they are really uh, using their European Union budget to provide us with guarantees of different sorts that can make it possible for us to do uh, uh, very impactful things. I came to the bank uh, uh, almost three years ago, just a couple of months before the COVID pandemic hit. And for me, it was so impressive to see what skillful staff in our bank can do with the guidance from management that now do as much as possible to help and support. I mean, uh, we have all the traditional instruments, of course, so we could use uh, program loans, investment loans to support countries inside EU, but also outside EU. We had, an, uh, we had a, a record year of uh, lending to Africa uh, during the height of the pandemic. We, but we also do uh, what we call venture debt. We go in with equity-like loans to innovative life science and biotech companies that can really provide solutions for the future. And what I saw just after some weeks in the, in, in the bank, one of those companies, BioNTech, that we had been supporting their cancer research, 
came to our experts and said, we can use the technology, the mRNA technology, to also create a vaccine. So we financed also that. And that, of course, was a successful journey for this uh, amazing company that uh, really uh, helped the world to cope with the pandemic. That helped us also to go forward by supporting COVAX, being able to we, we supply 600 million euros to them, uh, so for them to be able to uh, deliver vaccines globally to the most uh, vulnerable countries. And we used also a lot of resources to support health systems. For us, it is very important with our own staff that are not only excellent financial engineers, but also experts in life sciences and health. That combination is, I think, unbeatable. But it's also important for us to cooperate with the best organizations in the world. So we have deep cooperation, as Gordon Brown mentioned, with WHO. We do AMR funding with Wellcome Trust to try to see possible solutions there in the future. We do health diagnostics with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So we do a lot to see to that we can leverage our big balance sheet, our expertise with partners all over the world that can see to that we can get as much impact as possible. And those collaborations will come back as we continue to expand that possibility of collaborations and what that means in the world of health for health. As Dr. Andesina rightfully put, the purpose of this particular program. I want to move to the, the in-country view. We have two perspectives I think are going to be very valuable here. Um, and maybe, Minister Kong, I can start with you. Um, as you've heard about the, the innovations and in, in dealing with the future challenges, and I know from a Singapore perspective, the Healthier SG initiative and preventative care um, is something that you're focused on. Talk about your experience, the lessons learned from COVID-19, how you applied that to future health policy, and to be able to make sure that all the things we're talking about is sustainable, and not just one-time level investments. Thank you. Um, maybe I offer a case study of Singapore. <clears throat> For those who may not know, we are very small city, uh, 700 square kilometers, Southeast Asia, 5.6 million people, so quite a dense urban environment. And we went through COVID and we are rapidly aging. Yeah. Uh, by 2030, our demographic profile is probably close to Germany, one in four above 65. Um, so the baseline is this, because of aging, because of deteriorating health, we are projecting our healthcare expenditure to triple between now and 2030. Right now it's not high, 4.5% of our GDP. So we expect it to go up at least twice if our expenditure triple. So that's the context of our healthcare challenge. And then COVID came. And I would say that COVID in a short span of two and a half years, but actually it's less than that because we dealt with it in the most intense way in about one year. In that one year, it taught us everything about how to run a public health system. The question is whether we learn from the experience or not, right? So you just imagine COVID. Every health ministry know you can't wait for the cases to appear at your doorstep at the hospital. That will be too late. And that's when hospitals get overwhelmed. And that's when people die not just COVID patients, but non-COVID patients for the lack of health care. Uh, we all know that. In the end, how all our societies got out of it, uh, first, wear mask. Second, observe hygiene, wash your hands, that, that still matter. Uh, most importantly, take the vaccinations. And at some point, many of our societies disallow crowded, crowded events. Yeah. But when you think about it, all these are preventive measures. And in that short span of time, when we have to deal with a crisis, we know that the answer lies in prevention, especially vaccinations. But when you stretch out the crisis to 10 years, you boil the frog, right? In, a, in COVID, it's just boiling water. The frog jumps in, it jumps out immediately to say better work on prevention. I can't afford to stay in the pot. But when it's aging and you have 10 years of luxury, to deal with the problem, we are happily being boiled. And so it led us to really soul search to say that have we really done enough in preventive care 
to deal with aging? And answer is not. And so hence we launched a big reform effort that we call Healthier SG, SG for Singapore. Um, long and short of it is that things that we thought were not possible became possible during COVID. Um, and let's keep those measures for the long term to deal with aging. What wasn't possible before? Um, private and public sector, healthcare sector were separated. Um, but during COVID, we got the whole private sector, especially our GPs, to help take care of COVID patients. And they were the front line dealing with home recovery. Um, before COVID, we can't imagine everyone having an app recording your vaccinations, your tests, have you been infected, how many times, and now everybody carry that diligently monitoring their health. That wasn't possible before, now it's possible. In the past, it was not possible to do telemedicine because of COVID, now telemedicine is the norm. In the past, someone is sick, must be in a hospital, now we put them in step-down care. And in fact, at home if possible, that all became possible. So. Long and short, for Healthier SG, what we intend to do, mobilize the entire private GP sector to be part of the public health system and help us take care of preventive health for the population. Sometime middle of next year, we'll get a population above a certain age enroll in preventive care with a GP. We'll activate the community to organize all kinds of healthy things, including quitting smoking, exercising, eating healthy, to support them. Make social prescription a norm when you see a doctor. And preventive care, whether it's vaccinations, health screening, will fully subsidize and make them free. Singapore, by the way, is the land of co-payment. Uh, everything you co-pay. But we decided for preventive care, it shall be fully paid for. Uh, long and short, that is what we are doing is a major change in our focus because of the realization that we have not been investing in healthcare. We've been all been investing in sick care. We have not been behaving as a ministry of health. We are the ministry of sickness. I'm the minister for sickness, not minister for health. I'm trying to change that. Um, so in the coming years, big changes are happening. And this is a case study may or may not apply to every country or city, but I think something to look at. Well, it's an aspirational change, no doubt. And we'll talk about how other elements of society and communities and schools and, and employers and the like can participate actively in that process. But I'm delighted to have a, a parliamentarian amongst us because as much as we have these policies and put it in place, the multilaterals provide the guidance. We also have to make sure we put into legislative action. And so it'd be great, Esther, if you're able to talk about many things that you've talked about, you and I've talked about off stage, about the challenges that you see in participating in the health community and the public investment community there in Kenya, and in being able to meet the health needs of the population, not just today, but that future looking view, because many of the things you're hearing talking about are those future building blocks. We also still have those health needs today. You have the societal needs here today. So talk about that experiences and the challenges and maybe the way forward. Um, thank you. It's an honor to be here today. Um, I'm a member of parliament in Kenya, and I'm also a member of uh, UNITE, which is a global network of over 240 parliamentarians from 85 countries. Um, when I think of the people that I represent, Nairobi is a capital city with a population of 5 million and majority of the population lives in the informal settlements. These are what we call slums where there are, there's no water, sanitation. The houses are not conducive for families. You've got a small little cubicle made out of metal, that metal sheets or plastic paper and um, in, those, in that little square, you've got um, a family of probably six or seven living there. Now, the ugly face of the pandemic showed us that um, GBV was on an increase. Sexual gender-based violence was on the increase. In Kenya, one of the saddest things that happened during the pandemic, when we closed schools and we sent children home, 
to to be with their parents because they couldn't go to school over 200,000 young girls under the age of 15 were impregnated so we were dealing with early teenage pregnancies it was already a crisis in our country but it became an even bigger crisis during the pandemic we also saw a lot of women who could not access facilities because of the lockdowns um, when i sit here and i think of the one thing that Gordon Brown said was resources, we need to put money, we need to put money um, into health and we need to ensure that we're prepared for the next pandemic. I think it's not just preparing for the next pandemic, it's asking ourselves, what did we learn from this pandemic? What can we learn? What lessons can we take into the future? But when should we do it? We should do it now. The lady in Kenya, who there's some who actually celebrate the fact that we had a pandemic because all of a sudden we sunk boreholes everywhere. We had water tanks, we had government giving water for free, waterborne diseases went down. So there was the advantage, all of a sudden I don't have to buy water, I don't have to trade my body for water, water is readily available. So the fact that you had the pandemic made a few people feel, wow, we finally have water and it's uh, readily available. We have soap, um, we're, we're told to sanitize. But the fact is, um, when we look at health in, uh, in Kenya and in a lot of African countries, I think we need a lot more infrastructure. I'm really proud of Kenya in the sense that over the last um, two years, we've actually opened the Kenyatta University Referral Hospital, which basically will bring the students together with the medics. We've also opened another 24 hospitals, bringing the facilities closer to the people. But with that, we also need to make sure that not only is it accessible, but it's affordable. Majority of the people cannot afford to be on the national hospital insurance cover, which is like $5 uh, um, a month for your entire family. While you can't, when you've lost your job, you don't have resources, how are you gonna pay for medical insurance? So UHC has been a big agenda of the government, so has food security. So right now we're dealing with massive unemployment, mental health issues, the youth, which is the bulk of our population, over 70%, in this frustrated period of the pandemic, actually ended up going into drugs and alcohol substance abuse. So we have a situation where we're losing a generation to mental health we're losing a generation to not having the kind of lifestyles that they want so as a country we've prioritized uh, not just uhc you also have to prioritize affordable housing you have to prioritize food security you have to prioritize job creation understanding your population um, we're always talking about our population going out and looking for jobs and coming back um, in in coffins because they're not treated very well outside their country so i think africa as a continent has to look at how can we be food secure how can we enhance universal health care how can we improve the housing the water the sanitation how can we create jobs so we can't just look at health without the entire holistic approach towards making sure that every citizen feels included and not left behind so we say that we are running back on the sdgs and we probably will not attain them in the in the year 2030 as africa we've got agenda 2063 but i feel all hope is not lost so long as we are able to sit in in um in summits like this and then actually put our money where our mouth is we need to put the money to help each other humanity right now is the biggest challenge how can we feel about the people more than the profits. How can we ensure equity for everyone? And if we can't do that, then all these summits will mean nothing. So what we have to do is really understand that we are each other's keepers. We saw with the pandemic that you cannot think about uh, Europe, America, and ignore Africa. We've all got, we're all in one world and we all have got to care. Drought is really beating us right now. Climate change is a big issue. We hardly have enough food to feed our people. We're, we're turning into a desert. So what are we going to do to ensure that Africa is given the support that it needs to ensure it, con it actually 
is able to deal with all the issues that it had before the pandemic and post pandemic how are we going to deal with the issues of ensuring that the continent of africa is not just seen as a place to go and exploit but a place to go and partner this is where sdg 70, 17 comes in we can partner together and leave this world a much better place for the generation that is going to come after us because right now i think the whole world needs to pull together so that we can make a difference. Every child that dies for malnutrition, every tree that cannot grow, every animal that dies because of drought, we all have to care. And for us to care, we've got to be willing to share. So I really pray that the resources that we need, uh, which is over $371 billion uh, to ensure that we, we deal with the health uh, issues of the, of the, of the world, we need to put those together. So where will it come from? Private sector comes to Africa and makes so much money. Sometimes when I look at the profits that they're declaring, I say that we've got to up our CSR because there's no point in making all the money that you want to make from Africa. And then eventually you're leaving Africa worse than you found it. So we've got to make the money and leave Africa better than we found it. Thank you. Well, thank you the reminder of the challenges that we face and again the interconnectedness of all these issues um and i think it, it was a very nice transition as you talk about the private sector into our next conversation which is really about that responsibility and sir cohen i'm not sure if you were able to hear the former prime minister gordon brown's conversation the thumbs up sounds like you did um and he emphasized the importance of adding an h into the esg mold um, and how important health is a factor in that impact investing. I think you have been at the forefront of that broader impact investing. How can we insert H into that process and make sure that those in the private sector are rewarded for that responsible behavior and really committing to society's needs? So thank you very much, um, uh, all of you, for these brilliant uh, comments, uh, which I find very inspiring. I've been addressing the issue of innovation in financial markets uh, for more than 20 years now, working in close partnership with Prime Minister Gordon Brown. And the title of this session, Game Changer, is not an exaggeration. We are going through a period where the game is changing. How is it changing? It's changing by bringing impact alongside profit to both business and financial markets. And if you bear with me, I'll give you some examples first of how this is affecting financial markets in the area of healthcare. And then I'll step back to give you the broader picture, because I think we face a different type of opportunity now to galvanize massive finance to tackle health issue, an opportunity that didn't exist five or 10 or 20 years ago. So if you look at financial markets, they tend to change slowly. And when they change, they can sometimes change quite radically. We've had a long period during which we've talked about green bonds. And green bonds today are probably on a one and a half trillion dollar market. And we've seen health bonds and we've seen social bonds uh, come to supplement to those that deal with the environment. But what is really new and a game changer is the arrival of pay for success sustainability linked bonds, which today amount to two and a half trillion dollars and didn't exist two years ago. These are bonds where a company like Novartis or like uh, Teva in, in Israel, uh, or like uh, Frenesius uh, or uh, Oceania borrows money through the bond market or from banks, and the rate of interest it pays falls if the drugs of Novartis and of Teva 
access vulnerable populations to a greater degree than previously. The arrival of pay for success was inspired by the invention of the social impact bond, where Gordon Brown and I cooperated in 2010 uh, to launch for the first time private bonds to fund the achievement of a social objective, in that particular case, the reoffending by young prisoners who were released from jail, and paying the investors a rate of return that depended on the success. The greater the number of young prisoners who went into jobs instead of going back into jail, the higher the return that the investors made. And there are today about 250 uh, impact bonds. You may have seen the one from the Red Cross, which is called the Humanitarian Bond, dealing with um, health issues in, in conflict uh, areas. You may have seen the Israeli and the Palestinian uh, diabetes prevention uh, uh, impact uh, uh, bond. Um, you may have seen the cardiac bond in, in Canada. About 10% of, of the 250 uh, bonds deal with health. And the sums of money have been small, a uh, billion dollars or so of outcomes of uh, payments, uh, because governments and philanthropists haven't understood the importance of making sure, not just that we attract more money, but that the money we attract is spent well. And when you pay for success, for measured success, for audited success, you attract investor discipline to organizations, NGOs, and businesses that have previously never managed their impact because they've never measured their impact. So there is an opportunity today to harness pay for success and attract money, trillions of money, from the capital markets through sustainability-linked bonds that are connected with health. And I fully endorse what Minister Ong Ye Kung of Singapore so eloquently said about spending money on prevention. The great thing about the prisoner bomb I described is that it prevents prisoners from going back to jail and incurring for the state the cost of going to court and being uh, housed in a prison. Prevention is perfect for pay for success. And whether it be for chronic illnesses like diabetes or whether it be for obesity or whether it be for cardiac uh, issues. We have a major force now at our um, uh, elbow uh, that, that we can use in the form of uh, pay for success bonds and loans. But let me now zoom out, if I may. What's changing the world today? Well, there are three massive forces actually improving the world. And I know we don't often talk about major forces improving the world. The first is a massive change of values. It started with young people who didn't want to purchase the products of companies that create harm. It spread to a wider population. Investors became aware of it. And we have $40 trillion of ESG money, and I include health within social, but if Gordon wants to add health to increase its visibility, I'm on board for doing that. $40 trillion is about half of all money managed by professional asset managers. And we have two and a half trillion of impact investment, where you have not only the intention to create impact, but you measure the impact created. That's one massive force. The second massive force has been alluded to in our conversation, 
today, which is a force of technology. The leaps of technology that are coming through artificial intelligence, machine learning, augmented reality, the genome and computing coming together, in my experience as a venture capitalist, are as significant as the initial invention of the microchip. They enable us to deliver impact globally in ways we could never previously contemplate. And entrepreneurs are picking up the notions of impact and these new technologies to create new business models to disrupt every industry. Tesla started with the automobile industry, bringing risk, return, and impact, as Gordon was saying, to attract customers who don't want to pollute through their use of their car. It attracted talent and it attracted investors to get going because of that. And we are seeing now this impact-driven entrepreneurship come to telehealth, to teleeducation, to fintech, to clean energy, to every single sector where there is a major challenge, be it to reduce harm or to find a solution to the great problems we face. The third force is one which is very close to the WHO's heart, and it is the force of transparency. We are moving towards accounting transparency for companies that will show in a separate set, in a separate statement, alongside their financial accounts, as Prime Minister Brown was saying the revenues, the cost, and the four categories of impact that companies create, showing these impacts in monetary terms, comparing them between themselves and with profit. Impact from operations, impact from employment, impact from products, and impact from the supply chain. And when you take these three forces together, you can begin to see that actually optimizing risk return and impact today is the future of business and it is the way for business to perform better. I don't see many business plans anymore of companies that launch products that are going to harm people's health or harm the environment. It's no longer acceptable. And we see the SEC picking up environmental impact transparency, mandatory for every public company, all the way through to supply chain. We see the rest of the world under the financial regulator, the IF, uh, the financial uh, standard setter, should I say, the IFRS setting up a body, the International Sustainability Standards Board, to standardize the measurement of impacts across the whole world. We see the International Foundation for Valuing Impacts, of which I'm proud to be the chair, focusing now on standardizing the valuation of impacts. So when it comes to health, we have the opportunity to address specific health issues. And I want to go back to what uh, our friend the minister from uh, Kenya, Esther Basaris, uh, said, health issues are often intertwined with a myriad other issues. And the GSG, the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment, which operates in 35 countries, many of them African uh, ones, is focusing on the, the issues of people living in slums and addressing the problem of slums with infrastructure bonds that have a social or an environmental objective or bringing electricity and water and transport to slums, social impact bonds that can upskill uh, the residents of slums so that they get better jobs, impact bonds that work on the prevention of certain um, diseases, and finally, as the transparency comes to the activities of, of companies, we will see, as we see with Novartis and, and Teva, 
today. Companies raising billions of dollars and setting guidelines for themselves that involve reaching health objectives. So I'll stop uh, there and uh, congratulate you on bringing this uh, brilliant panel together. Well, thank you, Sir Cohen, and talking about how this has become away from the fringe and into the mainstream and the potential with this mean moving forward. It's actually a, a nice transition to you, Dr. Iyer. Oh, and talking about the work that you do and access uh, to medicine and the index that you create. Um, talk about what you've seen from institutional investors and companies and really being able to prioritize practices, responsible practices in health, particularly with a focus on vulnerable populations. That seems to be a really key element of this panel, rightfully so. Maybe you can talk about that from an industry perspective and how we're pushing in that right direction. Great. Um, thank you again for having me here. So I think, you know, it's not only the COVID pandemic, but already before that, a number of people around the world have already started to realize that we're, we're sitting on, a, on a, a situation where society is more and more reliant on fewer and fewer companies and fewer and fewer innovations that are actually available. And there's still an equi inequity uh, problem. So global inequity and access to medicine is a chronic issue and exacerbated in in uh, in current days um whenever you have uh, trade closures and, and border closures uh, you you see the, the effects of this more and more investors are now starting to realize that um we need to have a more responsible way of investing in the pharmaceutical industry and as a society we are reliant on the pharmaceutical industry big pharma big generics uh, local uh, players, uh, biotech companies for the innovations that help to prevent, treat, uh, and, and cure uh, diseases. So um, at the end of it, you know, what we've tried to do is, uh, you know, as an organization, we've been measuring the pharmaceutical industry's uh, activities on access to medicine. We're independent. Uh, what we do use is we use data coming from the pharmaceutical industry, from their partners, and we use that as a way to take the natural competitive nature of the pharmaceutical industry to compete uh, towards a uh, social good, who is uh, doing the best, doing more in addressing access to healthcare. Now, you don't change the pharmaceutical industry without uh, making sure that investors also are behind this uh, agenda. Uh, today, we work with about 150 institutional investors. These are large banks, uh, pension funds uh, all around the world. Um, it's about 150 of them. They manage about 25 trillion um, US dollars of assets under management. And they work in a, in, uh, in a way that um, encourages uh, pharmaceutical companies to, to do better and to do good. Um, how do they do this? A number of different ways. Uh, they use our ratings and rankings as uh, um, in their stock valuation uh, models and in sustainability frameworks. Uh, they engage with companies to manage risk uh, and to manage opportunities. They use best practices as a way to say, hey, what are you doing when this other company is doing this? Um, how are you addressing these particular issues? In 2014, we saw a number of uh, pharmaceutical companies having a strategic um, focus in Sub-Saharan Africa. And today we're starting to see which one of those are actually serious about, about access, which one of them is actually uh, enabling uh, access, uh, willing to share intellectual property, willing to uh, be really there to, to support uh, capacity building, but also able to make their products affordable and accessible in hard to reach uh, regions. Uh, we pay particular attention to vulnerable populations, whether it's conflict states or it is populations that are routinely left out of uh, healthcare and are harder to reach. So we look at supply chain indicators there too, and we try to educate uh, the investment community on paying attention to these uh, multiple uh, factors. Um, and they tend to use our um, uh, data and insights uh, as additional information on top of the financial uh, responses to, to the companies itself. Now, um, I think time is changing, and as, as Cohen said, you know, where this is a, a moment where there is a, a change in the game, but where we end up in the game depends on how we as society uh, react, right? Are we able to, to understand that access to medicine is a material uh, issue? Um, supporting responsible practices is what's going to drive the next generation of industries, uh, long-term uh, performance, uh, brand, reputation, and license to operate in these particular countries, or are we going to allow this, this global inequity to continue? Um, when you actually think about the statistics, it's actually quite jarring. Uh, jarring. Um, products that have been um, launched in the market for about five to 10 years already, they reach about 10% of treatment eligible patients in high-income countries like here. 
but less than 1% of patients in uh, low and middle income countries. So that already tells you the huge gap that needs to be filled. And we are hoping that more investors will get behind this. We're starting to look at whether mainstream investors are able to, um, to, to support uh, initiatives like this and engage with companies, push for that long-term sustainability. But it's, it's a hard battle because at the end of it, we are looking down on, um, on, on addressing these issues in a, in a, in a targeted way and, and improving access to healthcare overall. Thank you for that um, and giving a really specific example of how we're able to push those social good um, forward and measure that and doing that not just in medicines, but doing it in other areas like nutrition and making sure we provide that transparency incentive. There's obviously a role for the broader private sector, and I'd like to go back to you maybe, Dr. Encina, as we think about with your health strategy and the, the elements you laid out and your vision for what the private sector is able to provide and complement all of the work um, and the effort and the knowledge and the ability to be able to maximize utility for the African continent. Talk about the, the vision that you have and the need that you have for the private sector as part of that strategy. Yeah, when, <clears throat> when you take a look at the amount of investment, say, in infrastructure that's needed for health infrastructure, you need probably about an additional $22, $24 billion uh, a year to do that, which is, which is a lot of money. But it's not a lot of money when you look at the context of what we can do um, as multilateral development banks. It's been a lot of conversations about how we ought to change our business models. And I really believe we should change our business models uh, because you've got $145 trillion of assets under management globally. That's not been optimized. You've got in Africa $2.1 trillion of assets under management. That's again not been optimized. So the critical thing is how do we use our balance sheet at most lateral financial institutions to actually significantly leverage that? So let me start with the first point about what uh, the previous uh, uh, speaker was talking about. It's the role of issuing social impact bonds, and I fully agree with them. When Africa had the, uh, during the COVID-19 situation, the African Development Bank launched a social bond on the global capital markets uh, for $3 billion. It was at the time the, to fight COVID-19. It was at the time the highest ever social bond ever launched on the global capital markets. But we were able to do that because just in 2019, just before that, we had an increase in our general capital at the bank. So which gave us the ability to have the, the, the resources to raise that money. The point I'm making is that if we are going to tap into the $145 trillion and want to use the multilateral development banks, we've got to make sure that the capital adequacy of the multilateral development bank is effectively addressed in two ways. First, if you want to raise money from the private, cap, from the, from the private sector, it's risk capital you need. And so when you have multilateral development banks and you have callable capital, it's okay, but it's actually the risk capital you need to actually leverage that money. So we need more risk capital to do that. The second thing that I think it's very important for us is that because both for EIB, I don't know how much of your capital structure is, but our capital structure for us at the African Development Bank is largely callable capital. And so the issue is how do you enhance the quality of that callable capital in the rating of the agencies, so we can credit rating agencies, so we can raise long term money to actually support what we're doing. The second thing I think it's important, and I think uh, Chancellor, uh, um, uh, 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 the Prime Minister, uh, Gordon Brown, mentioned it, is the importance of securitization. We need to leverage our balance sheet significantly. And I'll give you two examples of how we've been able to do that very effectively at the African Development Bank. We launched 2018, the first effort of multilateral development bank to actually securitize. We took our assets that were actually non-sovereign assets off our books and we transferred them to the same institutional investors that people were talking about. For a billion dollars, we freed up a billion dollars to invest more in infrastructure. Now, Actually, on Wednesday, just when I get back to the office, just a few days from now, we are signing a $2 billion securitization, instead of securitization, with the UK government. That's going to allow us to free up $2 billion that we can invest in renewable energy. Of course, that renewable energy, as I said earlier in my comments, will be able to support us to connect um, well, rural clinics that you were talking about to energy 
last mile connectivity, which is uh, very, very uh, uh, important for us to, to have. But the other thing, of course, is how we actually share risk with the private sector. We plan within our strategy to deploy significant amount of partial risk guarantees, uh, partial grade guarantees to be able to leverage significantly these monies for the private sector. Sometimes I think that when we take a look at Africa and you were saying it so well, um, people think, well, Africa is very risky and therefore the risk, the amount of risk guarantees you need is so much. I, I wonder sometimes what exactly are we de-risking? And I think poss possibly we are de-risking bias uh, because if you look at the issue of losses over the last 10 years done by uh, studies by Price Waterhouse and others, they show that Africa is the second place in the world where actually you don't lose your money after, Latin, uh, after uh, 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 the, the, uh, the Middle East. It's better than in Asia, better than in Latin America, and so on. Yet, you see, capture isn't moving there. So there is a risk premium issue that we have to deal with when it comes to the, uh, the, the points uh, for Africa. The last thing I want to say is the, let me, let me come back to two issues. One is what we have today that we can leverage better. Gordon Brown was saying it. Today we have the SDRs, the Special Doing Rights by the IMF. IMF issued once $650 billion of SDRs. These SDRs can help us a long way in leveraging the private sector. Now I explain to you. The IMF set up the Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust, which is fine, and then the Resilience Trust and Sustainability Trust to which a lot of these monies have been channeled. And we are working very closely with uh, Kristalina and others on that. However, I have continued to make the case that this SDR should also be provided to multilateral development banks. Because if you provide us to multilateral development banks, we are a leveraging machine. We at the African Development Bank can leverage SDRs by three to four times. That's money that can go into health, that's money that can go into food, that money that can go into water, into sanitation, into education, into nutrition, and so on. And if we, <laughs> If we do it well, maybe we should not just look at the SDRs as a special instrument that stays on the balance sheet of central banks. Maybe we should change the name to, to uh, a, a sustaining uh, a, a, a development revitalization. Then we'll be doing a good thing because then you are, you are really triggering development uh, using this instrument. Last thing I want to say about how to leverage the private sector, it's also resource-based financing. And I think the uh, 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 speaker uh, before uh, also say this, is that you have instruments in which you can tell the private sector, based on significant amount of achievement of targets, then you get more resources for them to be able to do that. There's no doubt in my mind that we have institutional investors, but we have to de-risk them, we have to leverage them. And I fully agree with what uh, was also said, that it's not billions of dollars that we need today, it's trillions of dollars that we need today. But to do that, our business models have to change. We have to de-risk more. We have to uh, develop projects more. We have to make sure that we can leverage our balance sheet better to be able to deploy it better to leverage the private sector. At the end of the day, it's really how we bring uh, the resources together at a quantum level to deal with the challenges of the world. So we shouldn't be asking ourselves, how much is it that we have today? That's not the right question. The question is, what resources do we need to tackle the global problems? And then how do we scale our balance sheet and our resources to allow us to be able to do that? Dr. I am reminded of this concept of the private sector and the resources. And some of your talk about innovations, not just in terms of medicine, but in supply chain and solving problems. And I think about the ingenuity that comes from the private sector in being able to resolve those problems, because it isn't just about the access to medicines, making sure it hits the right people, the right place at the right moment. Talk about your kind of experience, and I know in Nicaragua and other parts in Sub-Saharan Africa, and kind of expanding those collaborations and the role of the private sector and others in really solving problems. Yeah, now, um, at the end of it, I think we have to appreciate that the pharmaceutical or vaccine or diagnostic supply chain is actually complex, right? So people are, for many company are, you're, you're relying on other companies to supply uh, reagents, uh, even the packaging from, from other places. So it's a very complex interconnected dependencies in the pharmaceutical supply chain. I think it's a very fragile supply chain. 
because at the end of it, we've got um, issues. I'll take an example. Um, in drug resistant infections, there's only very few manufacturers of uh, penicillin G in the world. And yet this is a, 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 an antibiotic, it, it's a component of, of antibiotics that need to be available in every single shelf. Yet we have very, very few suppliers to a point where if there is a fire in a factory, if there's a shortage, if there are border closures that don't allow product to get from A to B, we're in, uh, we're in a lot of trouble and people will actually die. And this has happened before. Um, so I think one of the things that we have to realize is you have to secure the supply chain by doing a number of things. Um, we're trying to push the pharmaceutical industry on, on, a, on a number of areas. And you see some good practices here and you know, more of those good practices will also be published uh, in, a, in a few weeks from now when we launch the next uh, Access to Medicine Index. Uh, where we demonstrate what has been done and what needs to be uh, still done. But I give you a couple of examples. Um, qualifying more uh, producers of raw ingredients, I think is an important aspect. Uh, certain countries are looking to invest uh, to make sure that uh, active pharmaceutical in ingredients are uh, more available in, in certain regions um, so that uh, it, is, it is available when you want to make a particular products. Um, qualifying more downstream uh, contract manufacturers, but also uh, making sure that more manufacturers um, have that ability and capacity to produce products, essential products. Part of the Africa um, manufacturing plan uh, tries to solve some of that issue by improving that local availability of essential medicines in Sub-Saharan Africa. And you see that also across the uh, globe in, in Brazil, in Indonesia, where more countries are starting to say, we need a few uh, key products that we're routinely running short of. And the pharmaceutical industry is starting to realize um, more and more that they need to be playing a strong role in this supply chain, uh, in the supply chain system. A few weeks ago, we, uh, a few months ago, we actually convened a number of discussions on raw material shortages, and we found a few key things, uh, key themes there that all companies have to pay particular attention to, and more investors also need to remain uh, invested in in this particular space. Um, but I think at the end of it, it's, it's, it's an issue where it is not well represented in a, in a lot of uh, platforms and discussions. Um, and it needs that level of global coordination and collaboration also between member states and parliamentarians that, that help to connect the, the world so that we're able to produce products in, in different countries, bring them to different areas so that more people around the world actually can access uh, the final products. Well, we could spend a long time here in this panel here. We're getting to our last little section, I promise. Um, and that leads me into the cross-sectorial perspective. And, and Mr. Ostros, I've seen your organization, the IB, in some states make the statement to increase the impact of health is to promote good economic policy. And this is something at the crux of certainly the work that we do in being able to look beyond just the outcomes, but the impact it has across society. Maybe you can talk about, about that a bit more and how do we how we take that from a theory and operationalizing it. So those from the ministers and finance and alike are also seeing health as an investment. Yes, uh, thank you for that. I think that this is really, really important because as a multilateral development bank, we always look for market failures or investment gaps. Where can we fill a role? And there's no doubt that the health sector is a classical example of a market failure that if we have no government intervention, no intervention from public banks, we will see very, very low levels of investment compared to the needs. And, and we see that also not only in low and in, uh, middle income countries, we see that also in countries that can be rather rich, but have poor systems like in the US with, uh, with huge gaps in the access to, to uh, affordable ha health care. So we, we try to crowd in private capital as much as possible, also to the health sector. We start with, of course, we as a, the largest multilateral bank in the world, we have surprisingly small paid in capital in our uh, balance sheet, but we go to the capital markets being AAA rated and can borrow 60 to 70 billion euros per year, tested by the markets all the time, but we can borrow it on very, very competitive rates. These rates can then be passed on to clients uh, outside the EU and inside the EU. So that is important, but we can also use that money that we, 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 we fund ourselves with to multiply the effects even more. And I think that is uh, really important in the health sector. We can do it by leveraging uh, uh, with other uh, uh, colleagues in the European Commission or in the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where we can get uh, donor money, grant money, and thereby we can take larger risk and get a higher impact. 
We can do it by going into equity funds in Africa, like we do in many equity funds, where we may be the first investor into that equity fund. We do our due diligence and we say that this is good people that is running this fund, and then others come in, other private actors, after we have done our assessment, and thereby leveraging that even further. And in the healthcare system, for instance, in, in Nairobi, I visited just a few months ago, a very interesting uh, entrepreneurial company that had gotten support from one of these investment funds that were active in the primary healthcare sector, especially devoted to low-income households, where they use sort of a hybrid model with primary healthcare facilities where the doctors were not there, they were uh, connected uh, via, via the internet, but they could press down costs and get the credibility uh, among households that they could really deliver good health care. So this is a way of leveraging, I think, that, that can be very, very powerful. We also, of course, are very much involved in direct support to public investments, not least in Africa, when it comes to uh, primary health care. We are working with WHO, where, for instance, in Rwanda, but also in Palestine, uh, in Rwanda, to assess uh, the quality of the primary health care system that is done by the WHO. And at the same time, we can see what type of bankable projects can come out of this type of uh, uh, work together. Very interesting cooperation. So we are the climate bank that what is what we are most no, known for, but I think climate and health uh, stick together a lot uh, because they both are real challenges that is not going to be able to be solved only on market terms, but we need to crowd in private market to de-risk private market to be able to come in to get the investment levels that are needed. And that is an interesting connection, I think, between climate and health that we should explore more. And yeah, we're certainly going to see more of that to come. So we bring this to a, a local level Minister Kong, I've, I've heard you talk about supporting people's high, healthy lifestyles, and that goes beyond just the remit of the health system, from the workplace to schools and the like, and being able to provide, I think in this terms, the, the real life guidance uh, for people to live those healthy lives. How do we bring all these elements of society together and the role that they can play in providing that well-being you talked about, away from sick care management to well-being management? That is certainly not just the responsibility and the opportunity within the health system, the broader society. How do we bring that all together? Um, <clears throat> I speak as an economist. Um, the problem is a failure of signal because we all know if we live unhealthily at some point, which is quite late, many years later, you suffer, but you don't suffer now you take a puff or you eat fatty food or you take sugar drink you enjoy now but you suffer much later and because of that nobody do the right thing so how do you bring the stuff either you bring the suffering earlier <laughs> which you can't <laughs> or you somehow educate people until we know what to do the right thing that's good for yourself and good for your future and good for your family and good for society and i think a movement like what we do hopefully raise the consciousness but i think is this is a problem not just for health it's in everything it's in climate change is is the problem of globalization when we globalize and, and people get rich people get good returns they don't see the impact later which is far longer term and so I think we are like a globalization is like a bicycle, too slow, you can't stand still, you topple, life don't get better, too fast, you crash. What is the right speed that allow you to balance and enjoy the breeze in your face and in your hair? And I think that's the balance we are trying to reach. I don't know if we are reaching that balance. COVID, I see silver linings, even though it's a product of globalization and degradation or environment, the virus came out. And because we are a globalized world, within months, the whole world gets it. And when you have a dangerous variant, within months, the whole world gets it. But on the other hand, we could see that globalization produced a response. Years of international research, years of IP protection, although it's demonized, but years of IP protection, development of pharmaceutical industry, bioscience, unprecedented development of a vaccine within nine months. 
and now we are looking at a 100-day project. Uh, but these are products of globalization, scientific advancement made possible. I think we live in a world now where we're constantly trying to balance our bicycle while still moving forward. In a local context, we are trying to write that balance too, stay healthy so that you don't crash. And I think that that is life in, in the modern world. Honorable Passeris, you, you had talked about very aptly the interconnectedness of all these aspects and the challenges in the city that you represent. What is that way forward that incorporates health, but also incorporates those other factors? So it isn't siloed nature. It really looks at not just health outcomes, but societal utility and outcomes that we can generate, maximize what that may be. What does that way forward look like to you? Um, when, I, when I look at um, Africa, I think the big elephant in the room that we need to talk about, which is also a health issue, reproductive health rights, is um, family planning. We don't do enough of it. And I think uh, one of the biggest reasons why a lot of uh, Africans did not get vaccinated um, during the COVID pandemic is because there was this talk about Africa being depopulated with the vaccine. So we need to make uh, the population understand that well-being is also about planned families. So uh, that conversation, I, I, I recall once going to a meeting and seeing almost every young girl with a baby or pregnant. And I was looking at them and I was thinking, she's not even 23 and she's already pregnant and carrying a baby. So I, I realized that when we talk about well being, and we're talking about well being comes with wealth and wealth creation. And there's no way you're going to do that if you can't look after yourself and the children. And, and then you're going through a lot of hardship, you're going through stress, then you go through mental health. Mental health. So I, I feel that we need a complete holistic approach. When you were talking about sugar and diabetes, I mean, whenever I tell my population that you need, you need to invest this $5 for your family to have ne the National Hospital Insurance Fund, they tell me we can't afford the $5. So I ask them, how much do you spend on sugar every month? It's $10. So I'm like, okay, if you stop spending the money on sugar, you'll be able to not deal with diabetes in the future, and you'll be able to have the medical insurance. So I think we, we need to create responsibility, and we need to be able to have these conversations. And it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress, you know, it's a work in progress. But Africa is ripe for investors. Right now, Kenya is a country, we, we've looked at the key issues, we know that the population needs to be served, we know the other big elephant in the room is corruption, uh, but the population wants services, they want corruption dealt with. We know debt is a big issue because we've got huge debt, so I hope that in the future we could find a way to manage our debt through uh, development banks in, in, in Africa itself. But on the whole, if we're looking at health, we can't look at it uh, as an island in itself. We've got to look at health all round. We've got to look at the person and understand that they need a good environment to live, a good environment to work, a good environment to, to grow, to thrive, because you only have this one life. So if you're going to lead this one life and it's hardship, you know, I, I had a lady come to me and say, my parents were poor, I'm poor. I see my children being poor. Now that leaves you in a state of hopelessness. So what can we do? We need to actually think population. We need to think um, how do we combat climate change? How do we combat health issues? How do we make it affordable, accessible? Um, and I think for me, I, I look at the world today and I just feel that humanity is where we're going wrong. How can we all rise that bar of humanity uh, so that we can be able to do things and uh, partnerships, pub public-private partnerships. We're, we're open right now for partnerships in water because we don't have the money and we know we need water because if without water, we can't irrigate our crops, we can't uh, look after our people. Uh, so we're, we're open for public-private partnerships. We're putting the laws in place. I feel that UNITE um, as a body of parliamentarians is a good place for you to engage the parliamentarians. World Health Organization is looking for more money. They want to engage parliamentarians. So we're the representatives of the people. 
Um, I know you deal with governments and governments and ministries of health when it comes to health matters, but try and use the platform of Unite so that you can talk to the parliamentarians or the representatives of the people. Because when it comes to budgets, when it comes to policies, when it comes to legislation, you go back to the parliamentarians. When it comes to implementation, then you forget that we exist. So we're saying we're here, we understand the issues, and we want to be champions. As Cedro said, we could, they could find a place for us and maybe call us champions so that we can articulate the issues to the population in a manner that will yield uh, what we want, which is health and well-being. Thank you. Sir Cohen, I'm going to give you the, the last word here. Um, and this may be a difficult question to, to answer, um, but you can hear from our esteemed panelists here in, in Berlin talking about a nuanced view and how you measure and look at health and that cross-sectorial point of view and not siloed. How do we generate that level of transparency, clear measures in health, much I, I, in the way that we're started to generate in the ESG side? so that everybody has the same goals and we can understand how those are pieces are interrelated. Any piece of advice you can think about generating that standards that have become standards in impact investing in the SG and apply it in a way that is nuanced and impactful in health. Thank you, David. My suggestion is let's pick one or two health issues. Let's pick diabetes and or malnutrition. Let the WHO bring together countries that are particularly interested in attracting pay for success capital to work on the prevention of both. It is by doing things that we prove that they can be done. Talking and trying to persuade is much less effective. So I would hope that after this meeting, we could have an effort on one or the other of these two issues, prevention of diabetes, prevention of malnutrition. Well, with that really powerful ending, um, let's give a round of applause to our panelists and their insights here today. Thank you, everybody, for the participation. The conversation will continue. Thank you again.